Hi guys, welcome to the episode of the Grapplers Academy. Today we're joined by Violet Bennett and Lorna Kinnock, uh, two really active uh, female competitors across the jiu-jitsu scene. We get into a lot of topical discussion on women's experience, their personal experience at gyms over the years and how they feel women's jiu-jitsu is currently developing and where they're looking for it to go over the next couple of years to come. Right, so it's a bit of a journey, <laughs> so strap yourselves in. Um, I started, I'd always wanted to do martial arts since I was a kid. I think I watched a load of movies. Mulan was definitely a favorite. Um, and I was like, I just want to be able to fight. This sounds amazing from when I was tiny. Um, but my mom, bless her, she had my best interests at heart and she didn't want me to break my nose. Uh, so she wouldn't let me do martial arts. I did like a tiny bit of Taekwondo when I was really little, but then that club, I, I, they stopped coming to my school, so I couldn't train. So as soon as I got my driver's license, I was 17. I like got on Google and I was like, okay, what, what martial arts are near me? And I, at that time, I'm from near Brighton. I live in like a really small village just outside of Brighton and it's quite rural. So there's not, there's not much around. Anyway, I found what can only be described in hindsight as a fight club. Um, it was just a group of guys that would meet at like eight at night once a week in a sports hall in the community sports center and just beat the crap out of each other um there wasn't really much technique <laughs> but i was like oh well this is what it is so i i showed up i was 17 and i i was quite skinny i was quite small and i was just like you know what let's go let's do this and i just remember there were so many evenings where I, I'd normally get petrol on the way home. It coincided with like, my like weekly petrol run. And I'd struggle to like get out of my car to get petrol because my legs would just be like a mess. It wasn't jujitsu, it was Thai boxing and that's where I started. So I did that. Um, and then I finished, I just finished college and I've been working a lot of different jobs, just saving up money to go traveling. And it got to a point where I thought, okay, if I could go anywhere and do anything, where would I go? And I decided that I wanted to go do Thai boxing in Thailand. So I went and I did that and that was incredible. It was amazing. Uh, that was where I first saw jujitsu. I didn't do any jujitsu while I was there really, but I saw through like this dark doorway, this like sweaty room of people just rolling around on the floor while I was doing some bag work one afternoon. I saw it and I was like, it's not for me that I, yeah, I'm going to take a pass. There were no women in there. Like there was no, I was just like, it's a no, it's a strong, it's a strong no for me. Um, then I came home, I went to university at the University of York and they didn't have a Thai boxing club. So I joined the mixed martial arts club and I'd already been watching mixed martial arts. Uh, that was kind of what got me into Thai boxing in the first place. And so I started doing mixed martial arts and I found grappling and grappling just took over my entire life completely so I first started at the university club which was I think the coach at the time was either nearly a blue belt or still a white belt it was very much like people just doing what they could um, and then I eventually found my way to elements martial arts in Brighton which is like an amazing amazing place it was so welcoming everyone was incredible and I just got in deeper and deeper but because I move around a lot I'm from Brighton went to university in York my ex-boyfriend's from Manchester, now I, now I live in Manchester, I've been all over the shop. Um, I got my blue belt from Yusuf Nabi at Elements, but I was training also at Combat Base in Pontefract with Darren and Helen Curry, who are incredible people. Um, and I was training at the uni club, I eventually became the coach of the uni club, and now I train out of Stealth BJJ in Manchester. So I have been all over the shop. <laughs> Um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm really glad that I have because I've seen so many different styles of teaching uh, and so many different styles of training. I've seen the good, the bad and definitely the ugly. So yeah, I'd say, although it, it hasn't been the easiest journey, especially as someone that likes to compete a lot, um, it can be really tricky when you're moving around a lot to kind of establish that kind of, you know, back and forth with a coach. I've, I've been incredibly lucky to have people who have supported me all the way through, like Yusuf, like Steve at Stealth, and Darren and Helen were amazing to me as well. So I've been very lucky there, um, trained all over the place. And what would you say is the biggest difference between like the Fight Club MMA style gyms versus the more professional, legit jiu-jitsu gyms where you've trained at? 
Um, I hurt a lot less, I'd say. Um, but I'd say the you're much more safe. I know that that sounds really stupid, but you are you are not risking really severe injury. And I I definitely wasn't safe by any stretch of the imagination at this Fight Club thing with regards to like injury, but also I was pretty much the only girl. Um, there was no kind of regulation or there was no one I could go to if someone said something really inappropriate. Um, so I wasn't safe. And I remember walking to my car at night and I genuinely was scared every time. I just, I used to have to park across the car park and I just remember walking every time with like my keys through my hands and I was like, I, I don't feel good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not happy. Um, the place I actually went to after that for a brief spell of time was, was a jujitsu and Thai boxing gym. I think it was more of an MMA gym. Um, and I wasn't very happy there either. Uh, again, it was a similar situation. It wasn't a fight club, but there were very few women and the attitude towards women training was pretty horrendous and again I used to have to sit in the car for like 10 minutes just like hyping myself up to go in like every session I was like come on you can do it let's go <laughs> but um I'd say with the more professional gyms you're made to feel welcome regardless of who you are and that's how I tell if it's a gym that I want to train at that those gyms can look so different from each other but if you're made to feel welcome regardless of who you are I feel like that's a real symptom or sign of a very high level and professional gym i think if a gym's not doing that you have to question why and you have to question if they're not doing that what else aren't they doing so i always look for if i go to a gym i look for women <laughs> and not just for me but because i think that women are a sign of a healthy gym um kind of like flowers on a plant um i think if there's a happy body of women training at a gym it's a good sign so i look for women and i look whether the mats are cleaned those two things are good things. If you're not cleaning the mats and you don't have women, I'm not keen. Okay, I'm not happy. <laughs> it's all blokes, whether it's a fight club or not, clean mats is a definite must. Yeah. yeah, like I'll train, I'll train in basements, I'll train in garages, I will go to anywhere in the world to train, I don't care where, and I've been all over the place. Um, and I don't care who you are, I don't care if, if I don't care at all, but, if your mats aren't clean and you don't have any women, there are exceptions to this, of course, but as a general rule, those are two good things that I look for still. It's funny though, like we've spoken about this, Violet, and I think it was you that drew this point that I'd never really put together, which is that like how a sort of instructor team treats their facilities always sort of mirrors to how they, the respect they treat their students. Absolutely. This connection that, uh, a coach that respects and looks after his physical environment almost sort of translates to the respect he treats for other people and I think that's really interesting point. No, uh, for example Darren and Helen's in Pontefract, it's not a big gym at all, it reminds me a lot um, of the gyms, some of the gyms I trained at in Brazil, but um, it's not a big place, it's not super super fancy, you know, but it's clean and everyone takes really good care of it. I'm, I'm not saying the mats are brand new. I'm not saying that it's like perfect. It's it's in a, like, a, I think a basement, but, and it's not brand new or anything like that, but it's about the respect that people treat their environment with. And it's not just about safety. It's not like I'm a bit of a clean freak, which I am. But <laughs> it's also just, if, if people are paying to come there and they're paying to learn from you, that environment should, be safe and healthy in, in all ways, not just kind of with regards to ringworm and other nasty, horrible things. And Lorna, what's your background and where have you been training over the years? Uh, yeah, so some weird similarities actually to Violet's, which I hadn't realised until just now. So um, I was the same, I'd wanted to kickbox and was always told no, there was a bit of a, I have like, old, like older parents there, but that's not for girls kind of thing, which obviously just breeds you that feeling I want to do more. Um, and I'd done what I would describe as like pretty sport, like gymnastics and figure skating and dance and things like that. There's nothing wrong with those things, but I'd never done anything a bit more sort of, um, contact based so I moved to Edinburgh for work uh, and there was this gym that was really small above a like a co-op like a city centre co-op which was the room above it had broken glass windows the whole way along as well and I saw people like laying into each other their boxing gloves on I was like well this is it this is my chance <laughs> so I signed up for that and just loved it and uh, the jiu-jitsu would always come on after 
the striking classes and I just saw I love that I still have the memory of seeing it through a, a beginner's eyes because I'd never seen the UFC didn't know anything about MMA I wasn't of that background and I saw it and I was like what's that because I think you know with striking you can tell someone like throw a punch and they'll know what you mean you say to uh, a person in the street show me half guard or like <laughs> a sweet they they it's hard to draw a mental image it's just we don't have as much a uh, reference point I guess in, in that world um so started the jiu-jitsu fell in love it was a uh, very I've never heard of a gym before or after like this one it's now shut so I feel better able to talk about it but um it's quite culty it was nogi only but didn't allow any leg locks um there was no grading or promotions um was no gi, was very, there was no drilling ever. I'd never heard of drilling until I moved on, which is weird. So it was just a very weird gym. Um, and I remember being about six months in and feeling like I was one of the best people on the mat, not from place of arrogance, but the turnover was just so high that it was, I was always with someone brand new and that seemed weird to me. But this is the problem of, if you've just started, you don't know what normal is. So it took me about a year and a half to leave. Uh, through other circumstances, the culture of that gym was not good. Um, <laughs> loads of reasons um, and eventually left because I just felt I had to and then moved to train under Rick Young um, who's a legend um, and that's a very formal traditional high level jiu-jitsu gym gi you know all the things you would expect and now I realize is much more normal and in line with um, and then was there for two years and then moved on to an MMA gym only because I've moved to location. So now I train with a lot of UFC, Bellator and Cage Warriors guys, which is completely different again. So yeah, I'm on I'm on the third gym in, in three years, which is quite quite a lot. Some left for legitimate reasons, some just moving house. But yeah, that's that kind of takes me to now. How did you find the sort of difference in culture between sort of like the second gym you're at then to the sort of more MMA with the professional fighters there? Oh huge, enormous. Um, I think the, the, one of the big things is it is such a, like a pro gym, most, a lot of, I don't think I really train with anyone that doesn't compete, which I think even in jiu-jitsu is unusual, you'll have hobbyists, where I'm now that's not really a thing. It's very, uh, the aggression and intensity of rolling is much higher. I feel like if I asked someone for a flow roll in my gym, they'd be like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's very every 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 round's a competition round, which you know is really good because no one scares me. No one could like, no one could overwhelm me with aggression or intensity in a match anymore because I'm just like I do this every day. Um, it's hard because everyone's bigger. I don't know if that's unique to this gym, but like there are very few light play, like it just there's a very big athletic build comparatively, and um, I want people to like play worm guard with me and they just they won't because <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sitting like with them in my close guard and I'm like I'm winning but they're thinking I'm winning because so you're into these weird stalemates as well um but yeah basically trying to get people to wear a gi lots more than they would like to and trying to work on top position is really hard because I'm small and MMA people don't want to go on their back for good reasons but like very hard to force myself up and be like, I'm going to pass. So yeah, it's amazing, but it's really different. And I travel a lot to other gyms to sort of plug those gaps uh, of what I might not get. I think, you know, every gym serves a part, like, you know, has really good points. Like the wrestling, I'm not going to get wrestling as good as what I'm getting where I am. Many other places, maybe anywhere in Scotland. Oh, okay. I think traveling, traveling to other gyms, like I do it a lot and it, it's huge. I mean, one of the places that I love to go down to is um, ASW in Manchester with Cam. I mean, I went down there when I first moved to Manchester because I wanted to work on wrestling and the way he coaches is incredible. He makes sure you get as much attention as you need and he really looks at your weak spots and he's really not shy to point them out <laughs> uh, no I love Cam but um, I think traveling for specific skills especially if you're in a gym where perhaps it's not as well-rounded as you might like is yeah, yeah. if you're able to is an incredible decision for sure I, I go to about three gyms a week which sounds like a lot but I have my sort of home gym and then uh, there's two days a week where there isn't jiu-jitsu 
because it's an MMA gym. So I go to Rex in Edinburgh on a Friday and then train and go to Open Mat on a Sunday. And I love that. I just get a bit of everything. And my coach is cool with it, which I think is awesome because it's led by the athlete, not by the ego, um, <laughs> which is cool. But yeah, more, what was it? Someone said more clubs than Tiger Woods, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's um, quite a, it, well, it has been anyway frowned upon, isn't it? Sort of training a, amongst different clubs. Uh, I know. In Manchester, it's a lot more relaxed, um, but yes. I've been to clubs and I've been part of clubs where it's kind of frowned upon and that was one of the reasons that I left the previous club. Um, so to the two of you then, like, have you just come across that and how have you just kind of navigated around that? Yeah, I mean, it, do, it depends Like, if it's at home or when you're away. I've gone to places in the UK where they're like, why are you here? You're quite suspicious. <laughs> what are you doing here at our club you've come to steal our secrets i think you kind of get a slightly better get out of jail free card and being a female grappler i'm like i need to travel to find girls yeah. you know um and that our divisions are so limited that like i can go train with 50 guys in another team and i'm not gonna like that's not gonna affect their competition or anything but yeah i don't know about you violet i i feel like it makes everyone better and if a gym has a problem with that it might be a red flag, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree with you on the women's front. A lot of gyms um, are very excited when a, when a woman comes to travel. They're sometimes a little confused or surprised because it perhaps is unusual, especially because I travel quite a lot by myself. Um, if I'm traveling with someone who's a man, especially if that's my, my boyfriend or my partner or whatever, there's a lot less surprise. Um, it's kind of assumed that I'm there as a tag along, which often isn't the case. And that's frustrating, but that's kind of another thing. But I did have one really weird experience once. And um, I still think it was ridiculous what happened. I was living in York um, and I would drive like 40 minutes to get to Darren and Helen's maybe two, three times a week. And at the time, uh, money was kind of tight. So petrol money was legitimate that was an expense um that i had to really f like factor in as well as paying for training they don't charge much for their sessions but it it really adds up so um i was struggling a bit there you know i it, it was it was hard and so i i wanted to compete with some more not compete but train with some more women and i found there were a couple of uh, women on the circuit in the northwest and i saw where they were training and i was like oh wow they've got like a really good women's team there they've got like like almost 10 women this is crazy and they were also checkmat affiliated and i was i just got my blue belt from elements who and they're associated with checkmat so i thought okay well they're both checkmat i can probably message this girl and who i've seen at comps and just see if i can come for a, a session on a weekend you know and i was really excited so i messaged her and she said, yeah, yeah, I'll ask my coach. She asked her coach and he, she was like, oh, are you, are you thinking to move here permanently or are you just coming to visit? And I was like, oh, it would just be a visit. I mean, it, it's like over an hour away. You know, I could just come on a weekend. And she said, yeah, I'm really sorry. Uh, we don't take visitors. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. Now I want to come anyway. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was a surprising one. I spoke to, to Yusuf about it and he was just like, oh, it just sounds a bit weird to be honest, mate. You probably don't want to go. <laughs> but yeah, I, I've had that before, but as a general rule, I've, I've always felt pretty welcome. I mean, sometimes people are surprised that I'm a girl, but that's okay because if there are gyms where there aren't very many girls, especially girls that are willing to really like get stuck into rolling, um, it is a surprise and it is new for a lot of people. So sometimes I think it's really nice to go to a gym where there aren't women if they've got a really brilliant coach um, because it, it brings something to their table as well. Uh, especially because I play, you know, I might play a little bit more technically than some of their bigger, like their bigger guys. It, they see new things, they try new things, and any coach that I think is worth their weight in gold is going to appreciate that. I, um, I visited a gym in Athens a couple of years ago, and uh, I was quite nervous because the Athens trams aren't, well not the trams, but like the tubes aren't the safest. Anyway, I got there, it was like this really run down industrial part of Athens, and obviously it's not my town I don't know it well and I walked all the way up these stairs and there were like little roaches and what is gross and I was like oh God, what am I walking into and I walked into this room and I must have been the smallest person there by about 25 30 kilos there were these huge huge Greek men all over the place like all no gi 
all absolutely enormous, all amazing as well, and all quite high belts. And I'd come for the no-gi class. It was the only one I could make before I, I left. And I thought, oh God, what, what's it going to be like? And there was a woman working on reception. She wasn't training that evening, but she was really friendly and spoke English. And I just got stuck into their wrestling class and I, w I couldn't, couldn't do anything to them wrestling wise. And it was about 40 degrees, but they were just so delighted that I didn't uh, die in their wrestling class and that I pushed through and just was fine with getting chucked about. And they were so happy. They were delighted, you know, that I had made the effort to come and that I'd had a really good time. Um, and they wouldn't let me pay, which was ridiculous. So I bought loads of their acai and just ate it on the way home. <laughs> but um, I was like, right, I'll take four tubs. Let's go. <laughs> um, but that's an example of a gym that if you saw it on the outside, you'd think, Christ, maybe this is not the spot for me. And I couldn't have been more wrong. Whereas then you've got a gym in England filled with women, the same, the check mattress like my gym, and they won't let me walk through their doors. So what you see on the surface isn't always what you get, I guess. Maybe they've got some secret techniques that they don't want to share with any outsiders. Maybe. <laughs> five finger maybe. death punch or something like that. So kind of on uh, an issue that has cropped up from both of you then, or fr from your experience over the years, what, what can gyms do for current jiu-jitsu players, females, to make it more appealing for them to come and train with them? And then also kind of tying into that, women who are looking to start or have, have an interest in starting jiu-jitsu, what can gyms do to make it more approachable or friendly for them to come in? yeah um an interesting one in this is a lot of people talk about what is to be a good training partner to women and they talk about their role and i think there's a bit before that that people don't really talk about which is actually making a woman feel welcome in the gym and part of it i think violet and i've both had the same experience in certain places and times where it goes right go pair up and it's like that thing in school where you're the last one to be picked and you're just like, like and you're looking and you're trying to make eye contact and you're being swerved and looking away. And then there's a guy and he, and he just grabs a nearest brand new white belt and you're like, but, but I, I, I do lots of jujitsu and I compete and like, you want that guy over me? Wow. You know, um, which is not everybody, but there are people that do that to you. So I think a huge thing for uh, guys to make women feel really welcome in jujitsu is to be proactive and be like, reach out to them to and rather than have to be asked sometimes I, I find and it varies by club and who's on the mat but I sometimes feel like I have to chase people just for a partner um, yes. <laughs> yeah do you feel that oh um, yeah I will chase people down dude I'm like you me now roll come on I don't care what belt yeah. you are because I can get away with calling out them higher belts I'm like right come on then like <laughs> yeah because otherwise oh, I'm just sat there like a lemon make a line for the bathroom I'm like no it can wait like because no. you just like <laughs> don't leave an odd number you know it's but I know my coach is great because you'd be like you you're going with Lorna no break up you're going but then there's that thing of like it takes such strength to not feel so unwanted in a sport that you love and you give everything to like and it's probably subconscious I, I think there are a few people caught like you know trying to make us feel that way <laughs> I would hope um but yeah that's 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 a really tough part um and i maybe that's true of brand new people uh, men and women but i think you get blue belts purple belts brown belt women that happens to you, and that's so crazy to me mm. um facilities wise as well sounds really obvious but like don't ask them to get changed have we lost Lorna? Oh. oh no you're there broke it up a bit there but i think you were going to say Sorry. Oh, sit on. just say what you said again I, I, I said facilities wise don't don't ask women to get changed in a toilet um oh. if you can have a changing facility for women like if that's at all option please please do that's nice yeah, i don't like it changed in the toilet without toilet putting your feet on the floor <laughs> it's hard it's hard it's real out there really yeah one thing one like thing i'd add to that as well is um when you have a big group of beginners men and women it's not just that they're learning jujitsu for the first time. It's not just that they're learning their armbars and their shrimps and whatever. They're learning about the culture and the culture in jujitsu, as soon as you walk in the door, is very, very different to the culture and the social rules and norms outside the gym. For example, if someone came up to me in the street and like put me in a collar tie, I'd lose my mind. I'd be absolutely furious. But if someone does that in a gym, even if we're not joking around, if we're just messing around, it's completely normal. And that's very normal to me because I've been training for some years. But if you're brand new 
all of those rules, especially the rules kind of relating to touch or to physical contact, people are learning those as well. And I think that you need to understand that white belt men and white belt women are learning those rules at the same time. But to avoid a kind of collision course between white belt men and women, or even white belt men and higher belt women, it, it, it can kind of be avoided that there'll be any problems by pairing white belt women with slightly more experienced men, mm. because that way, white belt women kind of aren't exposed to people immediately in their rolling or in their drilling that haven't learned the new rules of a jujitsu gym. So they haven't learned what's okay and what's not okay. They haven't learned how to react if they accidentally touch someone's boob because it happens like every session. And FYI, the best thing to do is just pretend it didn't happen. Just don't even make a thing about it. <laughs> it's cool. It's fine. But I think it can be really difficult for white belt men as well to be partnered with women straight away because in society or well, in our society, like the rules regarding touch for men and women are, are, di are, are quite different. And I think you see it especially when men train with each other because they're often a lot less physically comfortable with each other immediately. Whereas Jesus Christ, like my main male training partners would definitely get four of them in a bed top and tailing now and they just wouldn't care. It wouldn't be a big deal. They would not be bothered. <laughs> Whereas if you took, I don't know, four 20 year old lads off the street who'd never trained, that would probably be a little bit less likely. Um, so I think accepting that there are some cultural differences coming into the gym that white belts haven't learned um, and finding ways to navigate that in a way that lets people learn those rules and it kind of, you know, without by, and at the same time, like avoiding issues that can come up because a lot of white belt women that I've spoken to have said, yeah, I got partnered with this guy and he's being really weird. And, you know, I've heard that story a thousand times and nearly, I mean, I'd say a lot of the time it happens to be a, a white belt guy that hasn't learned the rules. Not always, definitely not always, but a lot of the time it could have been so easily avoided and at stealth what um steve does is he partners his white belts so when it comes to sparring if you've got a strike you can spar um he partners his white belts up with more experienced people so he'll say right you with you you with you and that means that all of the white belt ladies if they're sparring get partnered often with with men we don't have tons of women but they get partnered with like a really you know good purple belt or a good blue belt that knows how to roll with someone that's less experienced and smaller with them. They're not ending up with the, the 90 kilo white belt. They're getting the 90 kilo purple belt who, who knows what he's doing. And I think everyone learns the rules faster that way. And then everyone's, everyone's happy. Uh, if that makes sense. No, that's a really good point. That uh, something that I do try to do with my classes, um, especially in the beginners classes is if someone's brand new through the door, male or female, put them with the more experience. So they sort of mm. learn through osmosis about the etiquette and what not to do. And it's not that way to be trying to strangle each other. Yeah. Um, but like, say if there was um, like no, no experience sort of people in that class, if it's like a mm. beginner's exclusive class, is there anything that you'd sort of advise on how to navigate with a brand new woman and a brand new man, if they need to be paired up? I think that, um, one thing that I really stand by is making sure that everybody is on exactly the same page from the get-go. Um, I'm a school teacher, I teach secondary school English, and the way I always start the year is exactly the same. We have like three to five really basic classroom rules, and they're not complicated. It's like, be respectful, don't talk over anyone regardless of who you are, etc. I also have a no-touching rule because kids are weird. Okay, kids are weird. Um, and the rules are really basic. They're not complicated, but everybody knows them. And everybody knows what the consequences are if those rules are broken. And I think a lot of in a lot of jujitsu gyms, those rules go a little bit unspoken. And I think when there's gray areas, that's often where problems can arise because if the rules were never communicated, then there's a lot of wiggle room in there. So even if you just have your five gym rules on the wall of don't put your shoes on the mats, don't use any kind of alienating language that's homophobic or sexist or whatever, like whatever your rules are, draw attention to them immediately. And I found in teaching, you know, school kids that that saves so much of my time because immediately when one of those rules is broken and a kid, I don't know, chucks a pen at another kid's head, I say, Hey, the rules are on the wall. 
they've been on the wall since you came in. We've gone over the rules. You know you broke the rule. There can't be any arguments. We, we, we both know. <laughs> and then we can work with, then we can look at a consequence and whatever, and then we can move forward. But I think when the rules aren't clear, that's where things get tricky. And also if one of those rules is broken, know what your consequences are going to be and never waver ever. Yeah. Like it, the kids, kids and adults really are not that different. You can't, you can't be like, Oh, well, he did say this, but did he mean it? And he's a really good blue belt who's competing a lot. And I don't want to, you know, does it, no, like, cause, cause if one person sees that happen, they're going to think it's okay for them to do it. And that's where it kind of spirals in a classroom or in a gym. I, I don't see that many differences. I think the language one's a really interesting point. Yeah. Um, I, I call this out now because I've been around long enough that I don't care. But then I heard two training partners like before coronavirus going, huh, even a girl wouldn't tap to that. And like, excuse me, <laughs> you want to find out? Do you want to test that? Do you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, which is so dumb because no one even means that. I don't think of those people, you know, they, you don't even mean that. Like, why say that? You know, but then it's like when I've got new girls coming in, I'm like, don't let them hear that. Like, make them feel welcome. But um, yeah, I think as well with the white belts, if you are a small woman, because of course there are bigger women and, and maybe really athletic, strong women. I know some powerlifter women that are white belts. Um, but saying, you know, if it's, a, if it's a beginner's class, I think making them aware that like at first, the most athletic person for a little while is gonna be, win. Like they're, they're probably gonna win. And that doesn't mean you're bad at this. Just give it time, give it two years. And then, then it will, you know, the skill starts to ramp up. And even if you are a 48 kilo woman, you'll start to see that you can, you can sweep the bigger people, you can submit them. I think it's really easy to forget that new people don't necessarily know that. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. I just thought I was really bad for years. And then I found out, as, as soon as I started competing and I started winning, I was like, I'm not bad. I'm small. small. <laughs> confidence that women or smaller players, maybe generally, I can't speak for small men, um, get when you compete. Like, hold on. Look at all the. Like, I remember I had this like overhead sweep in a show uh, at Nagy, and I was like, I didn't know I could do that because I'd never been with someone remotely near my own size to try. It just came out of nowhere. And it's such an. That's like, I think, why women competing and smaller people competing is so important because you get to actually use it with someone your own size. And it's such a, such a lift. <laughs> I, I think so, um, women women don't get hyped up enough by instructors like the amount of male grapplers that are mentioned in classes uh, because it's a, a specific technique that they use or maybe they did it on a show recently and you say okay yeah we're playing this because so and so plays it there are some really sick female grapplers and even it's the little bits of language that Lorna was talking about mention Fionn post her on your page and say oh look at how she's playing i don't know whatever it is she's playing look at how she hit that arm bar that's what we're talking about that's how tight you need like it's tiny and it's not hard it costs you nothing all you need to do is watch one of her matches which really you should be doing anyway because damn but mention women in your classes it's it's these little bits of language which maybe don't really get thought enough about enough but it makes a, a huge difference i remember i was at a competition and i i actually didn't realize this until a few weeks later and i was warming up for my fight it was in dublin i was really nervous and i was warming up with sam quinn who uh, you guys obviously know um and later he was like yeah when we were warming up there was this little girl and she was just watching you warm up with her mouth open she was, and I was like, how old was she? She was, I don't know, like seven. And she had apparently just stood for like a minute watching me warm up for my fight. And with her mouth wide open, so surprised and so excited. And I, I mean, I never even knew, but it's those little things of, of women seeing women do what, what they want to do that make a big difference. I remember I saw Ronda Rousey fighting in the UFC. And um, that was the reason that I started that I, like gave me the final push to start grappling because I watched her like hit another insane armbar. I can't even remember who on. And I thought, you know what, like if she's doing it, then there's literally no reason I can't. And before I hadn't done it because I didn't think that there was the place in the sport for women that weren't insanely muscular. And this sounds, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but it, it was a thought process at the time. Ronda Rousey's quite pretty. And in my head, there were no women that weren't, 
but like didn't have really masculine features in MMA and none of them looked like me, <laughs> you know, like I don't have super masculine features and I saw her doing it and I was like, she's a badass and she's really pretty and she talks really well in interviews and like, if she's doing it, <laughs> then I probably can too. And so I think, and that's one of the reasons I started. So I think representation really matters, especially if you don't have women in your gym, doesn't mean you can't mention amazing women or post their videos or get them in for seminars and pay them please uh that's a big one but yeah that makes a big difference now you saying that violet we had we've had this conversation before that like in grappling it's the really pretty women that get like the exposure and the shows it's funny how like these women with beautiful features and faces that fit like their face bits and they're the ones that get the the flow grappling reshares and the the sponsorships and things as well I've been told from multiple people that I've only got super fights or sponsorships because I'm pretty. Oof. I've had that said to my face. <laughs> the <jiu -jitsu. laughs> no, and th but, but then there is there is some depth in that. It's not something that should just be um, brushed off and said, "Oh, well, that's that's crap." Well, maybe if I wasn't if I didn't look the way I looked, maybe I wouldn't have had some of those opportunities, and that's a legitimate thing you know that's, the representation that's that you're talking about doesn't just stand for women does it it stands for color for people of different sexualities trans people age there's one i forget about in jiu -jitsu. Oh, yeah. like, we totally focus on like this sort of 18 to 30 thing as well and there's so many cool either youth or uh, masters athletes so yeah i think that representation well, it definitely puts me at a disadvantage already, probably being the oldest person on the uh, on the podcast right now. But uh, you that's, that's for you. <laughs> we write for you. <laughs> uh, to expand on that a little bit, is that is that something that's it's probably kind of the case in all sport, isn't it? To be honest, um, people getting better opportunities based off looks or appearance. And what are your thoughts on how how people can get around that? What because ultimately it should come down to a representation of skill level and how well you can compete should be what it comes down to but it oftentimes doesn't so what are your thoughts on that well, it feels like it comes into two camps in women's jiu-jitsu there's the really pretty women who are amazing as well but there's something added that like, they're so feminine but savages which is a really cool marketing thing and then there's the women that are like really big and it's like you know your gabby garcia's and your tyannies and they get loads of because it's almost the opposite shocking it's like just this is extremism that people love and um, the contrast over here and then like these women that are just like don't fit the normal narrative of, of femininity but are awesome and strong and um, how do you get around it i don't it's really hard to say isn't it um i think there's a piece of i'm always shocked when i look on forums and like comments and things about like the low rankings coming up for women um and guys going i don't even know who that is who is be a mosquito and you're like what um actually the, some of the top ranked women maybe don't have as much recognition overall yet beyond doing an amazing job and gazarian Matuna and stuff but there's so many um i thought it was really interesting when the claudio deval thing happened how many <laughs> comments were like some women um accused so and so but you're like that's the number one ranked woman of the IBJJF right now and you're like some woman would anyone ever refer if gordon ryan made an allegation would it ever be some jiu-jitsu guy no um how you get around that i wish i knew the answer violet do you have an answer? i mean i think i have a partial answer um i think representation at all levels of jiu-jitsu organization is really important so i mean if we look at I don't know. It's it, it's tricky because it falls into the categories of brands, um, you know, big jujitsu brands, and then you've got competition. Like you're going to win regardless of what you look like. Like that, that's not going to change it. But are you going to get the sponsorships that are going to pay for your entry to get to that competition? And that's where it gets murky, right? Because you can say, oh well, so and so won, but then you look at so and so, and she got or they got. A sponsorship based on this based on that whereas someone else maybe didn't because they didn't look a certain way but i think that if brands make a conscious effort to look at representation and make sure that they are getting people from different parts of society maybe people who are of different races it starts to change the tide a little bit and i think this is kind of my general attitude towards 
kind of diversity and equality in the sport. It's the little actions that count. Um, there are big ones. There are big things that need to be changed. But if everyone made an effort to do the little things, we would see enormous change. And I think we're already seeing that quite a lot. I mean, there's there's already been such a wave of um, kind of requests or opportunities that I've been given, mainly since the Black Lives Matter movement, because it's it's kind of spilled over into jujitsu. Uh, people are really starting to think about, okay, like have I have I spoken to a woman about this or have I given a woman this opportunity or have I given a person of color this opportunity what about a woman of color have I done that and just having that voice in your head that's where change comes from so I think when you're having a conversation with someone about this it's not about um trying to force your view onto them because that doesn't work it's about a dialogue and I think if you can plant just a tiny seed of self-reflection in people who are in positions to give sponsorships influence the ibjjf get people on grappling shows get people on podcasts whatever if you're in a position to plant that seed for them to start enacting that change you're going to be much more successful and i think that 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 isn't just for women it's not just uh, with regards to kind of eurocentric beauty standards this kind of covers the whole kind of idea of equality and diversity if you can plant that seed of oh have i have i got any women on this card have i got any athletes of color on this card have i have i considered whether you know i could maybe have a trans you know athlete on this card i think if you can plant that seed i'm not saying it's always going to work but then you can start helping people to push change themselves if that makes sense yeah i don't know who it was the other day that said now when they see a grappling card that doesn't have a woman match on it they just call it male only invitational <laughs> it was a very a very clement said it about um competitions because i've i've tried to register for competitions before and um there's been no no women's divisions oh, wow. so i can't <laughs> i'm not allowed and i i won't say which show which uh, it was a small competition and i messaged and i said hi um my teammates are fighting on this i'm a blue belt i've won this 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 and this um what what are you doing for me and they were like oh yeah sorry we just we just haven't had the interest and i was like well you haven't really you know, <laughs> provide an opportunity for that interest so yeah um it's not gonna happen straight away but i think if you can have those conversations and those two-way dialogues instead of just like because i've definitely been guilty of just saying like well i'm obviously right and you're wrong and prejudiced. So I'm just going to say what I have to say and hope that you totally change your view. It doesn't really work. I wish it did. But if you can say, okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, have you thought about this? What are your thoughts on this? Do you think this would work? How could we do this? Yeah. Then it's two way. And then people want to push their own change. Challenging in the right way as well. Like there's a competition organizer that have been doing sort of um, male quintet style ones and I just dropped a message like do you want to be really cool if we did a female quintet and he's like oh there's not enough women in Scotland I'm like team Scotland versus team England get the five best of each let's go that would be so cool and he was like if you can help me make that happen I'll for sure do it and I was like just like that someone's just been really open to the idea and it was really cool to see the change but yeah it, as, as I keep saying it's beyond women in jiu-jitsu there's so many other minorities and things that I don't know about and I'm just trying to be really open to hearing about them from people that it affects that know more than I do because um, I'm in my own little bubble just like everybody else. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was an interesting point to discuss and talk about. I think some of the issues that you both addressed there are really important and actually we get re before we even get to that point of competition and representation from brands etc it actually starts at getting more people involved in the grassroots and getting Absolutely. more people in the sport in general regardless of gender uh, sexual sexuality orientation anything whatever it is it just involves getting more people into the sport in general and you violet wrote a quite an interesting article for women who fight um i think it'd be good to talk about that and getting younger people into the sport whether that be women I'd, women definitely need to be better represented in the sport but they also need to be encouraged and shown that it actually is something that you want to get involved in and that was something that i found quite interesting reading the article that you wrote on that so maybe you could expand on that a little bit and then one we can get your thoughts on that as well sure so just talking about um what young getting young people into jujitsu or younger people yeah. specifically from disadvantage 
Definitely both um, and also just generating an interest for people to do it and giving them the exposure and the opportunity to do so and actually just showing them that it's not something that's cut off for them as an option. Mm. Okay, so I think whenever you're trying to provide an opportunity for a specific group of people or a minority of people, for example, for people listening that might not have read my article, um, I mentioned I'm a secondary school teacher um, I did a series of self-defense lessons for vulnerable girls at my school and I use the word vulnerable because they were chosen specifically by their heads of year because they were deemed to be needing these classes for a huge range of reasons. Um, so they were kind of chosen specifically and I, I, I have some discomfort with labeling these girls as vulnerable but there's no real other way to say it. They're girls that are especially at risk for a huge range of reasons. So I think before you ever dive in to trying to plan provision in any form, you need to have a clear understanding of the barriers that have stopped that being provided before you showed up. And if you're not from that area or you're not part of that group, which I'm not, I'm not from the community in which I teach, then you need to invest some time in talking to the people that are and preferably putting someone with lived experience in a position of authority. So I spent a long time speaking with an incredible student. Um, she has just finished her year 11. She's going off to college. Uh, one of the most intelligent, you know, young people I've ever met. And we spoke at length about what was stopping girls specifically from wanting to do martial arts in her community and what was stopping young people from being able to engage and a lot of things came out that i i genuinely just did not know about um for example a lot of the older children so children over the ages of maybe 12 pick up younger children younger siblings after school and they have to do that because their parents are working if they don't pick the kids up the kids aren't getting picked up because there's no childcare. there's no money for childcare. Um, so that's a, like a barrier that could be preventing young people from doing jujitsu that I would never have thought about. Or perhaps, um, I mean, transport is an enormous one and it's, it's one that we've been doing some work on with Roll the Same, Lorna and I. Um, transport's expensive. I know that. And I know that some of my kids can afford the bus to and from school just and nothing else. So that might be a barrier. So I think whoever you're you're trying to engage it lets you know with jujitsu or with anything else you need to have a really comprehensive understanding of the barriers and also to work with people who are experiencing them to come up with solutions and that nitty-gritty work has to take place before you start diving into the really the really cool bit of actually teaching the sessions and that's obviously the best bit it's amazing but if you don't do the work understanding what's stopping these young people from engaging before you start they're probably not going to be that successful um maybe for one or two but it's like it's like shooting in the dark i mean you you just don't know so i'd say work directly with the community that you're trying to serve rather than working like for them because you probably won't serve them in the way that you really want to you might be very well meaning but you're not going to be able to provide what they need because you don't understand it. Um, secondly, if you're working with young people, um, I think you, you need to be able to have some kind of rapport with young people and not everybody can do that. Um, you need to be able to have a joke with them, but there needs to be a very firm line that they're aware of that isn't crossed. And what happened with the self-defense sessions that I taught was I got, I asked about, 30 students and i got under 10 that came regularly so if you look at that that's a very very low uptake rate and i was expecting that a lot of the girls that were asked who would have benefited massively simply were not going to do that and sometimes that's the case it sucks but it's true um you are not going to be able to get every kid off the streets and kind of into jujitsu but you're going to get some so i think don't set your expectations like super, super, super high because it will take time. And I'm actually leaving this school, but if I'd kept going and done it year after year, slowly the culture would have changed. So I think also knowing that it is going to be a slow process that requires consistency in order to be successful. And I know that there are a lot of projects, especially in London, that have been doing phenomenal things, especially boxing's really successful with it. 
with young people from disadvantage and getting them into sport. I recently found an Instagram called, I think it was called Carney's Community Center. I know Stormzy was there recently with uh, Nina Navid. Um, and she, she like showed him how to do a rain naked. It was really cool, but they, I don't know a lot about their work, but they seem to be serving their community, I think in Wandsworth really, really well because they're working with people from Wandsworth and with people who have kind of a lot of experience dealing with the issues that a lot of the young people are facing. So mm -hmm. I think it take, it really does take a community. Um, it's not about you coming in and saying, right, I'm going to change everything. I know jujitsu. I'm going to fix it. You're going to know jujitsu. It's going to be great. It's going to be a jigsaw piece in a much broader puzzle. Um, so yeah, I think that I'll stop talking, but I think that sums, <laughs> it, sums it up. No, I was going to jump in with the sort of story I always tell in this space about six months ago. Um, there's this guy that started, he'd been with us for about six months in jiu-jitsu and only ever done no gi. And so I sort of went, why do you only do no gi? Expecting him to say, I want to be in the UFC or something like that. And he said, um, I can't afford a gi. I'm waiting for Christmas. I'm going to get a gi for Christmas. But this was like August. And I was like, damn. Um, so I had a, I had a few views at the time, brought one in, gave it to my coach and said, can you give this to that guy over there and say it's a gym loaner? So he has one and just say to give it back when he, when he gets one at Christmas. And then he was a bit like, oh, she wants you to have her gi. And I was like, oh God, no, don't do that. He's this young guy. The last thing he wants is like the only girl in the gym to like giving him a gi. It'd be really embarrassing because I, that's what I imagine what it's like to be a 17 year old boy. Uh, and then he used that for months and then he started turning up for gi classes and this whole new opportunity was opened up to him. And it was only then that I could think, right, when I come into a jiu-jitsu gym, what do I need to do? Okay, I need to get there. So that costs money in most cases, unless you're lucky enough to be able to walk. And even then, if you're a woman or, or a young person or anyone actually at night, sometimes walking around in the dark's not the best. And then I need to sign in. So I probably need to have paid a membership. Again, it's not a barrier. And then I need to go into a changing room and change into like something to wear. And again, another cost. So that was actually the first time that I took a step back and said, although the system is set up for me in some ways, all those things had to happen and fall into place for me to have this opportunity to do this thing that I love. And that was quite mind opening that a lot of time when you talk about barriers in jiu-jitsu, everyone's like, but jiu-jitsu is perfect. But it's people that it's set up really well for that say that. And I'm and a large part, one of them, don't get me wrong, I'm very privileged. Um, but actually when you try to sh strip back back in those ways you're like oh hold on actually there's so many reasons why someone couldn't be set up to do this yeah for sure i think that's um often something that's very commonly overlooked within the sport is the cost of actually participating um i think i think that's why a lot of people don't start maybe because a lot of gyms primarily have a gi class as their beginners and the fundamentals classes as opposed to we've got no gi fundamentals and a gi. Um, that's partly why like I coach primarily no gi is being there's less of a barrier there for you to get through the door. All Absolutely. you need now is just to inquire, take up your trial and come in. Um, I'm not I'm not too familiar, but I used do you two know of any organizations where maybe there is like a gi exchange or anything for anybody who's listening who might have this as a barrier or nobody so know somebody who's got this as a barrier. This is something we're looking at as part of Roll the Same, which is the not-for-profit myself and Violet will work on. I don't know, is it a gi exchange or is it actually that, you know, when once you're done with the gis or they're too small, you shrunk them in the dryer a little bit or they have patches that you don't like, that can you then give them to the gym and gym build up a store? Like I, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. That's something we're looking at. But actually, how can gyms... Because no one's expecting a gym to go away and buy 40 geese, right? Because it's a huge amount of money. But actually, over time, how can gyms build up um, a culture of keeping sort of loaner geese to, to be available? I'm staying in Ireland just now. My friends who run T45 Jiu-Jitsu in Cork, um, and they've just, since they opened, had a bunch of their own geese and older geese on the go. And I still see loads of new people. I can spot them because I know my friend's geese. But I can see loads of people wearing them that otherwise just wouldn't. And I think it's super, that's so cool. But yeah, I don't know, Violet, what do you think? I mean, I, I'm definitely guilty of sometimes I have, I have kits sitting at home. Maybe a gi hasn't fit me quite right. And I, I always try and pass them on. I try and like come with like a, a pay it forward mentality. I remember when I started Thai boxing, um, I really needed some ankle supports. And 
um, a guy who I didn't know, uh, he just happened to be there at the same time as me, just brought me in some ankle supports that he didn't use anymore. Um, and uh, one thing that kind of I, I really subscribe to is, while there are lots of kind of awesome not-for-profits doing work and we're part of one, um, it literally just takes one person. Like the amount of change that one person in a gym can enact is absolutely enormous. Um, and you can do so much, even if that's, even if you're a coach, great. Or if you can have a word with your coach saying, Hey, like, could we, but like, I'll buy a, I'll buy like one of those big, like plastic boxes. And maybe we could just have the corner over there and people can put these in if they don't use them anymore. And you can give them to new people. Like maybe that's something we could do. It's good for the environment. Definitely. Uh, and maybe they can give a donation if they're able to a, a charity or, or to the gym, whatever, like you can have that conversation and you yourself in your gym can enact an, an enormous amount of change literally just by taking a pause and thinking and i know that a lot of people come to jiu-jitsu to get away from everything else in life and switch off for two hours and have a great time training i mean that's what i want to that's why i love jiu-jitsu because my brain is on not dying um <laughs> instead of like the to-do list i've got but if you love that about jiu-jitsu and you love that you can come and see your friends and train then if you're a half decent person surely you would want everyone to have that same opportunity to switch off for two hours especially the people in your community that may really need that two hours maybe more than you do i mean that's kind of a tricky thing to say but surely you'd want everyone to be able to get those two hours and if all it takes is you sending a facebook message to your coach and finding some old box to put keys in that's all it takes like what i did um over christmas was i saw that my local food bank uh was having a really hard drive for food they were really low on food and i know from the school i work in that christmas is like a really significant pinch time so is the start of the summer holidays and halfway through the summer holidays with regards to food poverty um because kids don't get free school meals over the summer holidays and they don't get them over christmas and obviously people spend money at christmas so i thought oh my god like what can i do because so many of my kids are coming in hungry and i can buy cereal bars but i can't do that in the holidays so what can i do so i messaged my coach and i said hey can i set up like a food bank collection just at the entrance to the gym um i'll put a list of what people could bring in i mean literally a tube of toothpaste from aldi is like 20p or something it, it's really cheap I mean, if we can afford to train, we can maybe afford some cans or whatever. And the response was insane. We got so much food. My little polo was like weighed down. <laughs> um, because I think genuinely at their heart, people want to do good, but sometimes they're not sure how to go about it. So look to other people for best practice, but also think about what your community needs, because you're probably going to be more of an expert on your community than someone from across the country is so look at what the problems are and try and have a think is there anything you can do i think it's better to try and screw up than just not try so maybe put a box see if anyone puts a gi in it i think you brought up quite an interesting point as well like jiu-jitsu has got quite a high financial barrier to entry especially when you compare it to sports like boxing and boxing definitely is a, an easier barrier for entry for people to get into a sport like martial arts or a combat sport because it's so easy to associate to. It's got lots of exposure in the media and, you know, everybody knows about boxing. Not even everybody knows about what jiu-jitsu is when you first say it. Training fees are usually high. It's usually quite expensive to compete. You know, you're talking about geese and all that sort of stuff as well. So definitely financial barrier is, is a big impact for people getting into it that maybe I, I didn't take as, as big an awareness before. So that's quite interesting. It's um, bearing all that in mind then, how, how, how and what can you do to, to make it more accessible do you think the prices for, for training or membership should be brought down to facilitate that or have an easier barrier of entry for people to get into it initially so that's something that we're looking at and i'm not going to sit and say that i have all the answers because we definitely don't and um, we put out a survey to the community i don't know if you saw it we've got 600 responses which is interesting and one of the questions was um something to the effect of do you experience any financial barriers in jiu-jitsu? And so I know we've got lots of verbatim that we have a team of amazing data scientists and analysts looking at um, from a few universities and things, which is really cool. 
um, and we'll see what that says as it comes through only close to a couple of weeks ago but um, yeah I'd be interested in carpooling is one an idea that's always in my head I speak as someone that cycled through gale force winds to get to my new gym for a full year because I couldn't afford a car yet and it was really hard and I walked through really dodgy industrial states at night um really scared with the keys like Violet said so I think it's really interesting like how many of us drive in or, or come in from areas where there's loads of other people that you could just almost put up on notice board be like by area kind of thing I'll be coming at this time you know or give so and so a shout if you want a lift he's he or she has offered to take anyone that's coming from the same direction that's a really interesting one to me um membership's really tricky I mean something that's really nice practice Rex Jim is when he does seminars and he announces them he goes here's how when it is here's how much it is if you genuinely cannot afford this let me know um and you can just come like it, it, it will just be covered but that is like a you can't afford it not you want to do it and go on a night out you know as, as i always caveat that's it i think that's really nice practice as well i think gym membership's tricky i was on a call to some of our amazing ambassadors and they were talking about the gym fees being like three figures <laughs> not hundreds of pounds and not yeah. 50 60 70 in london and that that i think that is a huge issue um but we i think we're going to look to to ask those questions because it's one thing asking people in the sport what makes it difficult it's a whole other ballpark asking people that didn't get that far the ones that actually just couldn't access it at all and that's where i think we need to do to do more work Thank yeah, you. I think what, one thing I'd be so interested in seeing, and this is very much just like a little brainchild at the moment, it's not something that I can vouch for I've seen in practice, but I was just thinking about it last night, so I may as well mention it. <laughs> um, I mean, I have a steady job. I can pay my membership fee now. It's not hard. I could probably pay it if it was £15 more expensive as well. Um, and so I wonder that if there was a, a scholarship program associated with gyms and if there was a model that gyms could access um, and kind of copy best practice so they wouldn't have to do all the legwork themselves of setting it up it was they could basically just adopt it um, of saying to people okay of course cool, so you pay let's say 70 pounds a month for your gym fee you can opt in to pay 15 pounds a month whatever and it covers some of the running costs maybe for like, like a kind of sponsorship and you wouldn't know who was on these sponsorship memberships. It would be a private thing, maybe for young people, maybe not, I don't know. But I imagine that in a lot of gyms, not all gyms, but a lot, most people could probably afford the gym membership fee if it's 10, 15 pounds more expensive. And if there's anything I've learned from training in lots of different gyms, jujitsu people are often really good people. Um, and they really like to look after people in their gym. It's like a family. We've heard it over and over again, and it's not without its problems for sure. But as a general rule, if someone said to me, cool, like, could you pay an extra £15 a month and we'll put it in a pot to sponsor like kids coming up from the area whose parents can't pay? I, of course I would. Like, and I doubt I'm alone in that. So I don't know if that would work, but it's, it's those kinds of ideas that don't work if they just come from someone like me they need to they need to go through not testing but they need to be discussed and thought about by people who would benefit from them and also would have to enforce them so maybe some like a group of a gym owner some people that would benefit from it whoever it would be interesting to see what came out of that for sure so just like fundraising sort of scale, like if there is a monthly regional open mat that everyone pays five quid to go to and that goes towards sponsorships for the month ahead for gyms in the area or i mean i know a local gym local to me that just if they know of somebody that has fallen on hard times or has been you know they're invited to our gym to pay at no cost and we'll get someone to give you a lift in and that's amazing, but I don't know that that's sustainable for all gym owners because I'm not a gym owner and I don't know how it works. Uh, uh, um, but yeah, I think it's something as a community we ought to just commit to thinking about a bit more. How do you identify the people that would love to maybe, or we don't even know what it is, but would love it and benefit if they could. And it, I don't think it's just kids. I think we fall into this like young people thing, which is amazing and has so much uh, credit to it. But 
like sports for everybody what about the 50 year old single mom that never gets time to herself you know and what you know did you, that's the great thing about a sport that you can usually do it until you're much older it's not like bringing a 70 year old into a cage <laughs> it's, it's a lot more realistic for a much broader uh, spectrum of society to get involved so i think it's such an interesting question i don't know what you guys think if you have any experience in that. yeah i think um like like Violet said then with the sort of scholarship scheme that's like a really good idea that and it'd be something certain that i'd adopt at my gym um if there was something that was there or even even as a sort of way to sort of start rolling it out because uh, the like i say the issue with the gym fees are is sort of there's a lot of hidden costs that go associated with running gyms. Well, there are. Um, like business rates, the rent, utilities, as well as living costs of the coach if it's their full-time job. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it is a sort of tricky area. Um, but yeah, there's definitely room for making it more accessible. Like you said, with the scholarship scheme to to sort of make make it easier for those that maybe have to apply for, maybe have to apply for it, right? Because it's kind of hard. Nobody wants to admit that they're going through hard times, but if they can go through an anonymous application form where if they're successful, they'll get an email or a phone call and that's the only time it sort of comes to light that they've been successful with it. Maybe something like that might bring more into the sport and take down that barrier of the financial costs. Yeah, and we we're hosting a, a workshop tomorrow with some competition organisers um, around the UK to sort of discuss access and inclusion in the competition space. Because that's another one that, I mean, like I make a, a decent living and even I find it hard to do all the stuff I want to do in competition because it's really expensive. I love when I MMA people I, I, I complain about person. I'm like, you get paid? <laughs> <laughs> you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> to do the thing, yeah. Um, but, you know, there are organisations like grappling industries that have been doing an amazing job of giving a certain number of free entry for people that have never competed before, just to give them the opportunity to and promote that access and inclusion. And I'm also really interested in that space too, that maybe there are people in jiu-jitsu, they just... There was someone in our survey that said, I've always made paying my tuition, like at the gym, my gym fees, a priority, sometimes over food and bills, but like competition is essentially just a stretch too far. And that, again, that's really interesting. It's such a big part of what we do. I think we could all probably attest to the benefits of jiu-jitsu that we all get from like the physical benefit, the social benefit and the, the mental benefit and release of actually doing a sport that you get to go and see your friends and interact with basically on a daily basis. And I know that's one reason why I wanted to pass that forward through coaching. And I think it's really important and just to get more people involved. Aside from the, the barriers uh, perceived from the outside, from what the sport is, actually just getting people involved in the sport, we all know how massively beneficial it could be as a whole. So the more people that could be doing it in general, the better. Um, but I, th I think uh, another thing that's like good for people to see as well is like what's going on in the sport at the higher level because when we think about why kids want to get into football, let's say for example, it's because there's a high platform for it. So you've got the Premier League or whatever, whatever sport it is, kids and adults are seeing the high level of the sport and they want to get into it. So by talking about jiu-jitsu from the professional scene, it is starting to grow now and there is a lot more uh, professional shows out there with, with good cards. There's a good card coming up this weekend. There's lots of good professional cards like Polaris uh, out there as well and all the good stuff that they're doing out in the, in the States. So with what's going on there and what's available, like, what do you think about the professional jiu-jitsu you've seen in general and women's representation of that? And uh, maybe I've got another question that we can dive into as we get a bit more into this conversation, but some of the match-ups or mismatch-ups in women's jiu-jitsu that are a little bit more prevalent as opposed to the, the more direct match-ups of skill or size that's usually the case in men's jiu-jitsu. So I'll start with a story. On this. So I went to a show, uh, driven down to England with some friends to go to a jiu-jitsu jiu show, uh, easy for me to say, and there was a table where you'd sort of sign a disclaimer for him, and the guys went and signed it, got the little band, competitor band, and I sat down and my friend was signing his, and then the person said to me, sorry, can you move so the competitors can sign their forms? And I was like, can I sign my form? And then he was like, oh, you can have a band if you want, sure, love. 
<laughs> it's like I was on the card and I was like no like I'm, I'm, I'm here to compete so can I can I please sign my form and he's like oh right oh yeah sure kind of thing and that was obviously with no intended badness but I was like this is a card of only about 15 matches and I am one of them that was crazy to me <laughs> so even sometimes when you're on the card you get these sort of weird weird situations but um I think we've come on a great way even in the time that I've been in the sport I've seen like battle grapple especially shout out to them they've done amazing stuff with putting on loads of women's matches and women's events in it um yeah I think there are still some cards in the go though that could be doing better but there is definitely a positive like direction of, of travel um I don't know um what more could be done in terms of the accurate not accurate but like sort of even matchmaking because it is hard I know Violet you've got loads of experience sometimes struggling to get a match um and both of us have been in the position that you're giving away lots of weight or experience just to just to just to be there because it's so slim pickings um yeah I think um there's one really glaring example that stands out in my mind um I was looking two days ago or a day ago I was speaking to Lorna and she was like oh, are you doing the uh, the ADCC trials and I was like oh well I, I'd love to but I weigh 66 kilos and there are two weight classes there's under 60 and there's over right now 66 kilos are like I'm pretty lean that's low I shouldn't go lower than that it's not a good idea so I would have to chop an arm to hit 60 and I'd be I would not be well um but should I be fighting 80 plus kilo women because I have no other choice in what's arguably the biggest nogi grappling event in the world. If organizations like ADCC have two weight classes for women, what is the motivation for smaller places to do it? I mean, that's the biggest thing. That's, that's it. Like, that's what I look forward to. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to see the best people in the world at the best tournament in the world the production value is enormous it's incredible and yet there's two weight classes yeah so in theory i could end up fighting gabby garcia and we'd be in the same weight class but do you not know, like i'm 66 kilos and the the arguments that tend to arise when this is mentioned um is that there aren't enough women to fill it i'm simply not going to engage with that because it's utter nonsense like there's, I don't even need to disprove that. You can use Instagram to do so. But don't so you think I think irony, it needs to, what? The irony though, that the reason, that's the reason why you would be put off it. Like they're almost limiting themselves. Yeah. yeah. Not enough women. And you're like, well, you've put in a weight class of 60 to infinity. <laughs> so yeah, like that to me is ironic yeah. that they're doing that to themselves in many ways. Yeah. Um. So I think it, I think we have to question the people in the biggest positions of power, but I don't think it is just down to them. Um, I think we need to make sure that we are matching women as equally as possible. However, I know from personal experience that there just are not that many women competing on a high level who are going to fit my belt level, my weight level, my age level, who also want to compete on that day in that place. I mean, that's a lot of asks because there are just less women in the sport than there are men and there probably always will be and that's that that is what it is but i think um it can be immensely frustrating as a woman trying to trying to find matches because i've had i've been to so many tournaments with my boys where i'm desperate to compete and there's no one um or i, I sign up and i wait <laughs> and i'm like oh maybe like <laughs> and nothing so I mean, one thing I'd be interested in looking into, and every tournament does it differently, is how they arrange um, like reimbursement if no one joins your category, because some places do, some places don't, some places are really shady about it. Um, but then it's tricky because if you're if you're sitting in a weight category um, and you you're thinking about whether to book that flight to Rome or wherever it is you're going that's stressful, you know, like because that's a lot of money. And I mean, I've definitely travelled you know internationally <laughs> just to get good fights um and i can only do that because i have a stable job and i can save up so it, it's a really tricky one because there are less women 
so there are less weight classes but then there are less women competing because there are less weight classes so i would definitely call out the adcc really really will call out adcc really hard and say this is ridiculous and it's not just the plus 60, 60 that makes me angry it's the fact that it is just minus 60 because you'll get 50 50 kilo women like um ricaco ended up in under 60 she's incredible but she's tiny and in her fight with Fion, who's also amazing, but also bigger than Rikaku, you can see it so clearly. The, I mean, there's, I, I won't comment on what would have happened if they were the same weight, because God knows, but why, why aren't there more weight classes for women at the biggest grappling event in the world? I mean, even, it's not just women that want to watch it. Like, I would much rather have seen Rikaku go against someone her own weight, because it, it's more equal. And I'm yeah. sure that men would love to watch that too. So, I, yeah, I think that if they're not, leading by example um ridiculous i think there's also like this issue that on the shows in the uk a lot of the time it's about network and who you know and actually because there's like a woman per gym a lot of the time and they're from you could be in the countryside of wales or the northern isles of scotland it's really hard to I, there are so many cards that don't have women's matches or have one and i don't know is that because no one's accepted more than that there's not an appetite to have more than that or actually they just don't know who the women want to compete are and how do you then as a woman like put yourself out there and i i like, i mean in scotland i know that i'll get invited to the shows which is amazing and really lovely and uh, super privileged to have that but beyond that for me to know the organizers in like the south of england and or, or you know where a lot of these things happen um, and I'm talking to smaller guys. I'm not expecting men to invite to Polaris. Don't get me wrong. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, but how how do you? And these contender series comes are coming out, and that's great. But then, then you're asking someone to get a flight to London and get a train or a bus to like to Surrey or whatever it is, and then compete all day, and then maybe buy a hotel to stay over. So then actually the opportunity again back to that financial point. If you're not in those those big cities, God help us. They put one competition in Scotland and everyone kicked off on the underground for a period of three months <laughs> so yeah it's, it's also quite tricky I think that how, how do you um sort of have a name and reputation um if you're not close to where those, those shows are as well and I think that probably is true of male and female I get asked all the time because uh, especially because I've moved around a lot I was Brighton based and now I'm Manchester based and literally the reason why I asked to be placed in Manchester when I started my teaching placement was the jiu-jitsu because it is the, the, well, the northwest is incredible for jiu-jitsu and the way my teaching placement worked was that I could choose an area and I could request a city but I wasn't necessarily going to get it but with the northwest I felt pretty safe I was like even if I end up in like I don't know Liverpool has great gyms Manchester's great gyms I'll probably be okay um but I get asked all the time by really amazing people that are doing matchups for shows I'll get a message in my inbox that says hey we're looking for a girl like this weight do you know anyone and I'm asked because I know a lot of women in jiu-jitsu and I am a woman in jiu-jitsu but what happens if you don't know me to ask me that question? Um, I've noticed that men that often have a really impressive knowledge of the high level competitors in the country often have a very low or limited knowledge of the female competitors. And it's kind of a self perpetuating issue because they're not on the shows. So they don't know them and they don't get on the shows because they don't know them. Um, and then it comes down to social media and followers and that's just a, a messy, messy place to be. So maybe some kind of, you know, easily accessible record of women and where they're competing and their weights, but then I'd want to make that for men as well. So I don't have the answer, but I think that what Lorna's touched on is something really important in that, you know, some women are getting more opportunities than others just because they, they're more well connected and that's not their fault. Yeah. Um, I'm quite well connected. So I get quite a lot of, you know, opportunities or asks on invitationals. Um, but there are women who are just as good as me at jujitsu um who perhaps don't get as many opportunities just because they know less people mm -hmm. and i'm sure that someone better at sort of knowing about like communications or whatever than me would would be able to come up with quite a good good fix for that it's also like on the shows like chris thompson's done a really good job of getting some like amazing yeah. scottish purple belts and brown belts um on on the shows and then i realized like, i've never really seen someone from scotland on these big shows before and I was like, that's really weird because we were loads of really great guys and girls. Um, but isn't that interesting as well that like, 
it can be so geographic. Like mm-hmm. whenever my teammate Stevie Ray was on Polaris and it was so cool to see like a Scottish person on Polaris and that was amazing. And I was just like, I, I, it must be difficult being a matchmaker on a card and running these things, but I love seeing more of the Welsh guys and the Irish guys, and I say guys with genderless tone, um, coming over and, and killing it on these shows and us all just bigging up the sort of UK and Ireland scene together. Um, just waving our like respective flags across Europe. I think that's really cool. You know, it could be a really cool thing to do. And I think it, I'm all for like low energy co- like fixes. So putting a box in a gym and saying, give food to the food bank. It was very little admin. Like, <laughs> and I'm a huge fan of things that, cause we're all very busy people and we all want to focus on our training, right? Like that's why we're here is what we do for. So I'm a fan of the low energy things. Um, imagine if we just made a post on the underground that said we want to make a fully like a belt ranked list of all the women who are competing at different belts different weights whatever who would be interested in matchups within the uk just generally we're not looking for a specific show and then let's say simon if you were doing a you know an invitational you could go you're looking for two blue belt 55 kg women who have said that they might be interested and you find eight and you can message them all and say cool we've got these spots probably five of them might not be able to do it they're injured whatever but then I mean and it takes the effort away from you then you don't have to know every single woman in the UK who's competing um and also people love to like comment their teammates on these things so I I don't feel like it would be um all the the only admin it would take is maybe making a spreadsheet and putting the categories in and then it's and is that true of like other minorities is that true of like rooster weight men or you know um like I don't know, masters, six athletes, and things like that. Like uh, possibly is. I think there's been quite a few um, websites that have been attempted to start up with um, mm-hmm. like belt checkers and just register yeah. for your gym. I think there's like a jujitsu style Facebook now. Um, belt checker. There's a. I've, I heard a belt checker. Yeah, I think something like that would work quite well, where you can just sort of go in, type in the parameters, and any athlete who's registered to that website would fit come in there you can message them directly from the website um i think one thing that especially in the underground it's a very negative toxic place um yes. anybody who posts anything in there that could be productive for the scene just gets fired up by <laughs> trolls and called so, a snowflake and a yeah. marxist and a virtue signaler and a white knight yeah, yeah we're familiar <laughs> we know <laughs> My um, favourite was when I was called a snowflake. I, I posted something with regards to um, to the Black Lives Matter rush guards I did. And someone called me a snowflake. And I was like, hon, I'm not the one that's offended. I'm not offended. I'm fine. You're upset. A snow, like, you're, you're upset. I'm good. Like, <laughs> I'm fine. It'd be good um, if you had, like, a jiu-jitsu resume, you know, a belt checker thing, because you might want to look for a lightweight purple belt woman and then you can go and say oh this person is fit that bell and has done this show before they've got a track record in mission mm. only shows they've done a bit of the ibgf circuit let's Too- push belt checker let's let's push belt. it sounds great yeah. let's do it <laughs> belt <laughs> checker we're coming <laughs> where, where do you think jiu-jitsu is going to go over the next five years and what's your plans in terms of aspirations for competing over that time frame as well Go for it, Lorna. Let's hear it. Why do I think Jiu-Jitsu is going to go? I feel like there's this like inner, like this blue belt in me, like, I don't get an opinion on that. (laughs) Yes, you do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I, what I hope, um, what I hope is that the the scene opens up for for everybody. Um, I, it's going to potentially be a bit of a bubble burst in the cost of competing. I think that's rising it like the property market <laughs> it's rising and rising I think we're going to see some change there I think we'll see more and more movement to different rule sets like sub only and, and all these types of things I'd like to see some sort of wacky experimental stuff going on in that space I didn't watch the overtime thing the other night <laughs> not that necessarily but um yeah I, I think jiu-jitsu is going to as, as an entertainment form, I hope establishes itself more separate to, to MMA and builds in that way. Um, what, what I want to do, that's an easier question. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I'm going to go to Worlds, which would be great. 
Um, I'm going to hopefully rebook all the competitions. I just got my confidence up really to go and do all the things I wanted to do before coronavirus. I'd booked something like every two to four weeks. It's just crazy. You're competing, competing. I just come back from winning the Munich, the IBGF Munich. I was like, great, I'm going to ride that wave and then everything got cancelled. So yeah, for me, hopefully just building on all of that, getting more experience and becoming more fearless. <laughs> what about you, Violet? What about me? Um... The main thing that I'm really excited for in Jiu-Jitsu at the moment is what I see coming from our juvenile competitors, um, both in England and overseas. I'm really fortunate that I train with two incredible athletes, Libby Genge and Tyrese Cunliffe, both out of the Northwest. Um, they're two of my best training partners and I learn the most enormous amount from them on a weekly basis. They are truly exceptional not just as as humans or young humans but as athletes and as competitors and i think seeing young people like that coming up in our sport is a scary time <laughs> because jesus christ the things those two can do with leg locks is is worrying um it really is but they're i'm really excited to see the young people coming up in jiu-jitsu and and also young people that have ideas about what they want to change i think I think it's a really, a really impressive time. And definitely th since I started in my little fight club, um, the, the fact that these conversations are being had and that even though the underground is like a seething toxic pit, um, people like me and Lorna are still out there being like, well, I'm going to post my Black Lives Matter rash guards and you can hate me, but people are still going to order them and I'm still going to make a load of money for Black Lives Matter. So your comments really do very little but boost my post. Um, so I think people, especially people who perhaps couldn't have spoken out before or didn't have the confidence to do so, stepping up and saying, I love this sport and I love the people in it, but we need these things. I, I love seeing that. Um, I think really we're on an upwards trajectory of inclusion and also like production value. Um, the fact that I can go on YouTube and find out exactly how to hit this 50-50 entry is amazing. Um, the fact that I can go and learn that is huge straight away. It's a magical time. So I'm excited for what's coming for sure. And I think that, that things like the ADCC weight classes, I think it's a matter of time before they bow to pressure. I really do. I just want to keep keeping on that pressure so it happens sooner rather than later because I don't want to have to wait till I'm, I don't know, 35 to, to get the opportunities that I should have had now. Like, I don't want to wait. Um, I'm excited for the next generation, but I want my opportunities now um, and I deserve them. So I'm willing to fight for them. And with regards to me and what I'm doing, um, I'm at quite a funny point in my life, a really exciting point. Um, I've quit my job and I'm going traveling for, you know, a good long time, probably about a year before I do my master's in 2021. And my plan is to go kind of all over the world, mainly Southeast Asia, um, and train and travel and do like a little cool videography and photography kind of media project. I, I want to interview gym owners and film the rolling and do all that, all those kind of fun things that I haven't had time to do with a full-time job. So I'm doing that, but kind of long-term, um, like Lorna, I want to go to Worlds, I want to go to Euros. And there's one thing on my list, which has been on my list since my first kind of session as a brand new little nogi white belt at the University of York. Um, I had watched Polaris uh, the day after my first session and it was one where Leonie Munslow was on it. Uh, she was like the first female black belt I'd ever really heard of, her and Cat Hill. Uh, I knew of them in, in the UK. I weirdly didn't know about many women in the US. I think I hadn't got into jujitsu that deeply. So I knew about the UK scene definitely before I knew about the US. And I'd seen that Leone, who is a firefighter and just like all around amazing person, had been on Polaris. And I thought, you know what? Like one day I'm going to be on Polaris. And I, I wasn't even that fixed on whether I won or not. I just wanted to be on it um, because she'd done it. And I was like, I'm going to do that. And um, the person I was dating at the time who also trained uh, laughed at me and said, that's ridiculous. Like, you're not, you've literally just started, like you've done one session. Like, why are you? And I was like, I'm going to be on Polaris <laughs> and you're going to see, and it's, it's going to happen. So that's kind of been with me throughout my whole time. And Polaris is awesome. Don't get me wrong. But you know, when you've had those goals from day one and you're like, um, and when you hit those goals, I don't know about you guys, but it, it hits really personally for me. It's a real landmark. Um, I had a really tricky time at 
Nogi Euros last year, I was at quite a difficult point um, with my work. Work was very stressful. My mental health wasn't good at all. Um, and I'd cut the weight. I'd done the prep and I got to Nogi Euros and I just didn't want to be there. Um, I was in the bullpen and I texted Sam and I was like, I just, I just want to go sit on the beach. I don't, I don't think I can do this. Uh, which is not like me on comp days at all. I love comp days. It's my favorite place to be. I love it. Um, yeah, I look forward to them. I think they're awesome. And um, I won one fight. And then in my second fight, I just didn't do what I wanted to do. I lost on a couple points. I just, I felt awful and I didn't do what I wanted to do. Then, uh, and that was in Rome. I went back to Rome, uh, my first competition at Purple Belt uh, for the UAE European. They're like Europeans, basically. And I was fighting this amazing girl. I had one fight, one girl had pulled out and she was like the highest ranked in Europe. I think like the second highest ranked purple belt in the world. And I was like, right, okay. Um, and I went and I won uh, and it was in the same venue, like I think October, maybe like five months later and I won. Um, and it just meant everything because I'd done, I'd realized the work I needed to do wasn't actually do a Jiu Jitsu. It was about learning how to rest and learning how to look after myself. Um, and I, I got there and I won in the same venue, my first comp at Purple Belt. And it meant like, it, I'm sure it meant more to me than winning Euros has probably meant to some big black belts, you know, like it meant everything. So I don't think it's always about the comp, whatever it is. It's about what that one means to you. Like I've won comps and not cared. It's not cool to say, but I've won them and been like, I don't feel like I did very well today. I just happened to win. So I think setting goals that mean something to you rather than just the title of the competition is, is important. For me, anyway, it, it drives me forward for sure. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, with sort of, before we close out, like just gonna drop back a little bit before you say, but you about these sort of like female athletes and how sort of male athletes get a bit more of the spotlight. I'm gonna admit I'm pretty guilty of that, but I'm also, ignorant to every other weight class other than my own like I know <laughs> I just literally I just focus on my weight class Fair um, so can we sort of give a shout out to maybe the athletes that you both look out for locally internationally um and yeah like just sort of shed a light on all these these athletes that sort of go unnamed um, I think it would be really cool. Um, some people just like to watch jujitsu, but I think it's nice. Like I watch specific people for specific things. Um, and I watch a lot of male jujitsu as well. But if Lorna, if, if you know what people are specifically good at, it might be nice to mention that as well. Like I know that um, Abby O'Toole, for example, who's a, a purple belt in the UK, her guard game is phenomenal. It's really strong. So I definitely, I'd look out for her, Libby Genge as well. She's a juvenile blue belt, but she is terrifying. Uh, she's awesome. Watch out for her leg locks. She's been, she's been really working on those, but also everything she does is good. Um, I mean, I don't feel like I need to mention Fionn. I feel like she's mentioned <laughs> enough. Um, who else have I been watching? Marina. I've got to mention Marina. Marina. She's awesome. Yeah, she's a brown belt now out of Carlson's. Again, just really well-rounded game, really tough, quite lightweight, um, but does not play a lightweight game. So that's really fun to watch. Um, I think uh, someone who doesn't get that much recognition, and I don't know why, I think it's perhaps because her spoken English isn't that great, as far as I know, is Natieli de Jesus, who's um, a really high level female black belt. I think she's a heavyweight um, and her she plays a lot of, like lapel guards I think she plays what does she play maybe collar and sleeve I can't remember but she, her that works really strong from her um Anna Rodriguez is young she's coming out of dream art um she's beating some really big people she's beating Talita Alencar she's beating all sorts so I'd watch out for her and um Yara Suarez as well is one of her main training partners again she's more heavyweight she won brown belt world's absolute I believe um, over Gabby Pisana, who's another amazing female now black belt. And they're just these young up and color up and comers. They're Brazilian, most of them. Um, and they just don't seem to be known. And I don't, well, I do know why, <laughs> but, um, they're just, they're just women that should be watched. Uh, their matches are phenomenal. It's so exciting. Uh, they're incredible. And yet they're just not really being watched. Um, I was watching 
what was I watching? I was watching some jujitsu the other night with, with Sam and he was like, oh, let's put on this entire women's like EBI card. And it was a casual thing for him. And I realized that no one who wasn't a woman had ever said that to me ever. Um, he was like, yeah, yeah, let's put this on. It's got some really good people on it. And I was like, why am I so surprised? Like, why is that such a, a big thing? But it was. So well done, Sam. You go. Uh, but yeah, amazing women out there. Lorna, do you have anyone to, to add to my list? Um, who do I like watching? Leah Budd. Amazing. Yes. Rosa Walsh from Ireland. Rosa also, Walsh. I think both, both, both purple belts. Um, some great women there. Yeah. I think... Um, just I think support your blue and purple belt women and white belts obviously but I think um, something that really struck me was watching I don't know if you saw Fionn's post about Gary Tonin shared her GoFundMe when she was a blue belt to go to Worlds and that was kind of like her like springboard from there and we would all not, not us but people would have laughed at her at the time or any blue belt doing a GoFundMe to go to Worlds I'm sure but actually you can look back with hindsight and go that blue belt came beyond Davis so I think it's just really important to to support and provide platforms for but I'm saying this completely selfishly as well yeah help us <laughs> please <laughs> but yeah some of those women that we've just mentioned they're just they are going to be the British European world champions medalists of, of the future so I'm really excited to see what they all do Oh, Nia Blackman. Nia Blackman out of Fight Zone. Uh, she's got to be like 16 now and she is unreal. So even if you're not, uh, you know, watching her fights because she is still a juvenile blue belt, you know, if you see that she's got a match on an invitation, I'll go watch it. Like, it's amazing. If you see her stuff, share it. It's, it's the little things. And I think a lot of our lower belt, not lower belt men, but our purple belt, our blue belt men get a lot of support. And I'm, I love supporting them for sure but make sure we're paying those same dues to those women because they're going to go on to win things like Fionn's one. And Nia we Blackman. love knowing that she's, you know, that she's from our side of the pond. So she's incredible. The women. Yeah. As there's one person you can point to to say, well, probably when like the Grand Slam competitions, it's probably Nia Blackman. Yeah, she's insane. And she's insane, yeah. Cool. Any, yeah. any th final closing thoughts or messages or questions to post to the Jiu Jitsu community as a whole or even any shout outs to sponsors that you've got going? Do you want to shout your sponsors Lorna and I'll do mine? <laughs> Let's be those yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> I think my lasting message though and my big learns of the last couple of months with the role the same involvement is be open minded to being wrong and not knowing um, in our community because there's stuff that I've just become aware of and conversations I've had that I'm like I didn't know, I've probably said the wrong thing and done the wrong things and I'm really grateful to have had my eyes open and if everyone could take that approach, our sport would be even better because it's full of cool people, let's just make it better. Um, sponsors, um, Smash and Pass, um, which is uh, do awesome gym gear, um, they support me loads and do some really cool custom stuff and then um, from SNC side Fundamental Health Scotland does amazing very sport specific um, strength and conditioning training with athletes from martial arts football golf rugby the whole whack so yeah that would be the, the Scottish the Scottish brands well my lasting message would just be uh, a big thanks to you two guys for for getting us on and for for listening and and asking awesome questions and using your platform to to you know to really promote what what we've been talking about because you really easily could not have done that um it no one would have criticized you openly for it no one would have said that you were horrible men <laughs> um but you're you know uh, yeah just just a an example of good practice that I think, especially because of your positions of influence, do a lot. Um, Dan Strauss did a really great interview recently with Women Who Fight about how he's he has become a feminist. And he, he gave an anal analogy that really stuck in my head and he talked about a scale. If you put like me and Lorna at one end who are like very much about equality and then you put someone who doesn't want women in jiu-jitsu at the other end, often the people like me and Lorna are not the ones that are going to be very successful in convincing that person that actually maybe women should be in jiu-jitsu it's going to be someone in the middle who's perhaps a man and perhaps used to think like them and has changed that is going to be able to plant that seed that I talked about before um, in their mind so I think if people like you who have positions of influence that maybe I do not have for a variety of reasons use those positions 
we're going to go a long way. So it would be a big thank you to you guys for doing cool things. Awesome. My sponsors, um, One South, they are a sustainable apparel wear out of Brighton. Uh, they're awesome. They make their rash guards out of recycled ocean waste. And I, I always look like I'm a walking advert because I'm always wearing their stuff and Lorna makes fun of me for it. But it's just really comfy uh, and cozy. So One South, big up. And Rob Nittman, who's my new strength and conditioning coach, he's trying to get me to eat less chocolate and lift more heavy things uh, on a consistent basis and i love working with him and i would really recommend um just getting if you can afford it or if you can beg borrow or steal it in any way um a, a coach for strength and conditioning has really changed uh, not necessarily my lifting but my consistency with my lifting because uh, life can get in the way but if someone's asking that question of have you done your workout you're more likely to do it so yeah, thank you to my sponsors and to everyone that keeps me in one piece on the mat. Well, good. Well, personally, big thanks from me today for coming on as well and opening potentially, hopefully, a lot of people's eyes up to some topics that they've not necessarily thought about before and just keeping that discussion going, really. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully, uh, have you back on again in the future um, to further the discussion and also see where your jiu-jitsu's gone to and show off your medals. Yes, crack them out. <laughs> cool, thank you so much, guys. Awesome, perfect, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks for watching another episode of the Grappers Academy. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to hit the like button and also hit that subscribe button. And if there's anybody out there that you think could benefit from anything that we talked about today, don't forget to share the video and pass that information on.